I ran into Theo Katzman about a month ago on a Sunday afternoon at the Rough Trade record store in Manhattan. I was not expecting to see him, but I also wasn't very surprised when I did. One of the first things I asked him was, what are you doing tomorrow and do you want to come over and talk? Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. I don't do a lot of repeat interviews on this show, not because I'm opposed to it. Actually, as time goes on, I realize that there are real advantages to having multiple conversations over time with a person, seeing how they develop and evolve, tracking the trajectory of an artist. That's one of the benefits of having an ongoing project like this. For me, really, it's just that there are so many great people to talk to, and I have a finite amount of time myself. But see, the thing is that Theo Katzman is just one of my favorite artists. He's one of my favorite songwriters. He's one of my favorite singers, one of my favorite performers. He's just so brutally honest about what he's going through in his writing and his delivery in general, and I admire it so much. I think part of what connects so deeply about his songwriting is that it's so intimate, almost confessional. But of course, as we know, if you look inside one human, you will have a little window into all of humanity. The personal is universal. The political activists will tell you to think globally but act locally, all that. So the more open and willing a writer is to share their own personal truth, the more likely they are to connect with our collective personal truths. And I think Theo is really a master of that. One reason I wasn't so surprised to run into him the other day was that I knew he had played the night before at Terminal 5 in New York. And I knew that that's a big deal for Theo. He's an unmanaged, independent artist. During COVID, he ended up moving from L.A., where he had been living, to the woods of Michigan and setting up his own kind of private oasis off the grid. He started his own label and his own recording studio fueled by his own philosophy of record making and life living. And eventually he released his latest album, Be The Wheel, earlier this spring on his new label. To be headlining Terminal 5 on his own terms was significant for Theo. And it was also significant that on one of his few days off on his tour, he came out here to Brooklyn to talk to me for a couple of hours. On top of that, he was dealing with a sore throat and a weakened voice. So I lured him out here with the promise of a special throat healing elixir called Le Remède du Bolshoi that I had just brought back with me from Paris where I had suffered from my own vocal cord issues on a tour. And I had discovered this magical elixir. And it worked. It, it did seem to entice him out here. Anyway, if you know who Theo Katzman is, either because you heard my previous episode with him or because you just know who he is, then I don't need to tell you anything at all. But if you don't, then just a brief thumbnail sketch. Theo first got noticed through his work as a multi-instrumentalist with the band Wolfpack. He plays drums and guitar in that band, and he sings, too. Over the years, I've interviewed pretty much everybody in and near Wolfpack. It's a band that was started at the University of Michigan over a decade ago by a kind of creative mastermind guy named Jack Stratton. Theo is an accomplished musician and singer, and Wolfpack definitely shone a light on that aspect of what he does. But he's always also been a kind of naturally honest songwriter. He speaks the truth in his songs, and his command of the musical and emotional vocabulary of songwriting is, to me, somewhat astonishing. So, yeah, when it comes to Theo Katzman, I am totally down to do some follow-up interviews. And this one is not only a follow-up, but it's also a long one. So get ready, because we covered a lot of ground. Third-Story.com is the place to hear the full archive, previous conversations with Wolf and Wolf-adjacent artists, and my first episode with Theo back in the day, plus hundreds of other conversations with songwriters, musicians, members of the creative class. We are made in collaboration with WBGO Studios. Visit wbgo.org studios to check out all the beautiful work that's getting made there. And then it's patreon.com slash thirdstorypodcast to help grease the wheel. Theo's new record is called Be the Wheel, and my new slogan is Grease the Wheel. Here's me and Theo Katzman talking it down in Brooklyn last month. We begin our episode listening to Theo as he experiences the magical throat-coating elixir from France for the first time. Here's a little bit of water. So just drink that. Wow, it smells French, man. Right? I mean, the French, you know. Okay. All right, here we go. Down the hatch. Whoa. Wow. It does a thing, right? Yes. So when you if you do it right on the throat, how much are you supposed to do? I you have to know. understand the whole conversation I had was in French with yeah, the pharmacist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of you losing your I mean, I'm yeah. sorry you lost your voice, but yeah. I love the idea of being without voice, 
going to a French pharmacist who gives you a vocal cure remedy in French. Amazing. Perfect, man. In the interest of protecting your voice and also because I've been thinking about you all day mm. since I ran into you yesterday. Man, that was so cool. So Kismet. beautiful. Perfect. Kismet. I want to preface this conversation by filling in a little bit of what where I think we left off yeah. last time, and then you tell me if I've completely misrepresented you in your life. But I'm sure you have not. What Go I ahead. remember, and this is just sense memory about our conversation last time, mm-hmm. was one of the major themes that stayed with me was a kind of internal struggle that you were feeling at the time because you had started to gain a lot of kind of notoriety and fame through your association with Wolfpack, which was great, and you love those guys, and it's amazing, and it does showcase all these wonderful things, but you also sort of had this feeling that there's this other part of you that was being a little bit undernourished, I think, at the time. You could sense it, and even talking to Jack and some of the other guys in the band, like they all knew that also. Yeah, 100%. And they have also go through that. I mean, everybody in the band has a solo career. I remember having that conversation with you. And as I mentioned to you yesterday, when I bumped into you, I also remembered that you had already explained to me that part of your journey, when you let, you had been in New York, you went to LA, you had this pressure as a younger man to like have achieved X, Y, and Z by a certain age. And those included having a building of your own or having a studio. (laughs) You were like trying to like really build a thing, an empire, a little mini empire. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so setting the stage with that. Wow, yeah. Nailed it. I remember the last time I saw you before yesterday was off to the side of the stage at Madison Square Garden Yeah, as you were about to take the stage with Wolfpack in this legendary sold-out show. You were so generous with me and also told me in that moment that our mutual friend Louis Cato had gone out to Michigan to make what was about to be your next record and how that was a great moment for you to not be playing drums on your record and allow yourself to sort of open up the process a little bit and Mm -hmm. that you and Lewis were writing songs at the same time and encouraging one another Mm -hmm. to write songs. And um, and that record ultimately came out, Modern Johnny came out at the end of 2019. Very beginning of 2020, like January 6th, I think, or or seventh or fifth, you know, like one of the right at the so beginning. basically yes, end of twenty nineteen. My head exploded with that record. Oh, it, cool! It man. was so painful and so so joyous. I mean, mostly Sweet, joyous. Man. You know, that's the. I, I'm glad you said those two words because <laughs> yeah. that's the yeah that's, that's the edge. I I try to, uh, you know, I mean, I life feels that way to me most a lot of the time, to be yeah. honest. So that's kind of the yeah. what I go for in uh, in the song. So that's I love that edge. I mean, sometimes I think if I hear something that's really good it angers me and makes me not want to play but when i hear something that's great it inspires me to want oh man that's a cool distinction man very helpful you know what i mean when something is is like taps into like our our best potential you can't it it makes you want to confront your best potential not you know isn't that wild of somebody else yes i agree that's an amazing phenomenon it's like uh I think it's maybe that if you can tell that something is really honest and really from the source of someone's journey, sort of like if you can tell that somebody went on the hunt and they caught something, you're sort of immediately reminded that in order to catch something, you need to go on the hunt. Yes. So it's sort of like, hey, all right, you know what you're doing tomorrow morning. You're going to start preparing for the hunt or you're going to start going on the hunt. And you you can only confront yourself there. I mean, I will say your songs sometimes have messed with me because of how honest they are. And it is very difficult to reach that level of honesty when we do our work. Totally. Man, Leo, I love you, man. (laughs) I love you too. I can't help it. (laughs) Uh, It's true. So I really, really deeply appreciate hearing this from you. I'm like, whoa. I feel very happy that you that you feel that way. So thanks for sharing that. Achieving that, yeah. it's been a process that I that I have to continue to make sure I I stick with it, the the part of about, about the honesty part. And I really want to give some credit to a couple songwriters: May Earlywine, who's currently opening for me; Benjamin Jaffe, who's currently opening mm. for me; Rhett Madison, who mm. opened for me last time; Caleb Hawley. Mm. The list goes on and on. Mike Viola, Aaron Lee Tajan. This is off the top of my head, but there have been people in my mm-hmm. life who I, whose music has touched me in the realm of that honesty that you're speaking about. It touched me so intensely that 
it's like once you see, you can't you can't unsee, unsee it. it. I've really made it a. Uh, it's almost like you have to surrender. You have to kind of surrender and ask, almost like pray that you can find that for yourself because you can't replicate someone else's thing. But what is what is your honesty? What do you have to say? And it's going to look different for everybody because yeah. we all have had different experiences. So I think sometimes people confuse the actual words with whether or not it's the honest thing. Well, totally. And that's why when you hear some people, like, for example, you, you know, you also play this wonderful game of saying deep things in simple words. That's very hard to achieve. Like, it's one yeah. thing to, like, try to be real smart and deep and use real smart and deep words. And it's totally. another thing to say, like, a hundred years from now, remember all new people. There's nothing that yeah. anybody who speaks German and is just learning a little bit of English won't understand about that. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, good good point, because particularly that was... That was uh, written on the wall of a Buddhist yeah. temple in Thailand. Yeah. So presumably that's all the English that whoever wrote that needed to know to get that message across. Yes, exactly. So it's like even more direct. That's right. <laughs> but even that whole song, I mean, like a hundred years from now, if anybody remembers you, it's probably because you were an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? One hundred years from now, no one will care about anything you ever did anything you ever said and if by chance they do you were probably a jerk or likely even worse kept people down by force but perhaps you were a saint that's an honorable thing gave your life to help the poor fought injustices and wars either way you get the Time to waste, just find yourself lost and ride it till it breaks. All anyone will say is, Wait, what was that name? But don't worry, it's okay. Actually, it's great, cause no one's keeping score, so, so just get over it. You know that theme. I remember in a in a song of Caleb Hawley's that I yeah. heard years ago. I mentioned him already, but he's yeah. a great songwriter yeah. out of New York, and one of my good friends. He had a lyric in a song where he was like, "My great grandfather, I don't even know his name." Y wow. You know, and it was like, "Whoa, man, that's amazing!" And then you start to really think about it, and you're like, "Well, I actually don't know my great grandfather's." full name either yeah. i don't know his middle name I, yeah. I know the nickname people called him yeah it's kind of wild you know it's like this whole human thing doesn't really last more than a hundred years you know but we never think about it everything i said to you so far i didn't even get to the thing i'm trying to get to nice keep going okay so that record comes out you go out on the road mm -hmm. shit's really popping that band was killing yeah it's crazy you're filling rooms yeah you're not the only person that this happened to but you're yeah. out on the road in march about to wrap up a leg of your yeah tour you're i think you're in the midwest when yep. the shit went down yeah yep we were about to play detroit there were three shows left it was march 13th or whatever i remember i you know i saw a new york times headline yeah we were like okay there's a virus okay yeah 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 the, the month prior we would we would like leave seattle on a friday and then the monday headline would be like outbreak in seattle and you'd be like, huh, hmm. we were in a room with 1,500 on yeah. three days ago in Seattle yeah. that it happened, that kept happening. It was like, it was trailing us. And by the time we, yeah, we got that headline, it was like, I, I remember turning to the band after we had just agreed that we wouldn't talk about this all day because it seemed like this was this hype thing. Yeah. And then I'm like, uh, hey guys, I know we said we wouldn't talk about it, but um, the NBA just canceled yep. its entire yep. season. Yep. It's like, what? Yeah. It was wild. So here we are, two and a half, three years later. Yeah. You turn up with the next record. Yeah. A label that you started. Yeah. You've relocated to the woods in Michigan. Yeah. You had been basically living in LA before that. Yeah. You went through some shit, yeah. it seems like. Definitely. Like you've discovered Wim Hof and ice bathing and yes. breathing, which yes. is not a insignificant part of your life now. Significant. It's it is significant. significant. Yes, yeah. definitely, yeah. 
I guess what I want to do to start with, if you don't mind, I let's go, man, is just hear what happened and what yeah. that window of your life has been like. Totally, man. Well, when the tour ended, and maybe this is the thread that kind of yeah. ties it together, is like I was always a singer songwriter, but I was also always a multi instrumentalist, mm-hmm. and I and I just loved playing in bands, and I would I love playing with my friends. That's what got me into music. It it hadn't really occurred to me kind of until Wolfpack took off that there are results that could possibly happen with things that you do with your time. You know what I mean? <laughs> consequences. Yeah, like I mean, this is the best possible consequences yeah. to have something you're involved in do well. Yeah. But nothing had ever hit before. I had sort of at the end of college I toured with another band called Mind Your Disco for a few years. And then I basically left that band to do my own solo project. So when we started Wolf it was like, oh yeah, this is just a side project, you know? It was just fun. So when that really took off, it hmm. was amazing. And it was, as you said, it was also like, I just got scared that I wasn't going to have time to do my the thing that I set out to do. Right. But part of what I set out to do was collaborate with my friends. So it was like, that was, that was great. But then there was this period of time that I t- internally felt like I had to catch up with Wolf, you know, which just seemed impossible. Because it was like... Catch up meaning your career be at the same y- level yeah, as Yeah, it was because yeah. we were literally, you know, we're playing the garden. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I can't catch that. Yeah. That's the crazy... This is the only yeah. self-managed band ever to sell out the garden. This is like, you can't assume you're going to do that any, ever. <laughs> right. And at the core of that band is an independent marketing genius. Yes. Who, like, yes. we can't all be like that. No, and, and really, that's the joy of it is like, yeah. just to be really clear, I mean, I love... Sometimes people... It's funny because sometimes people won't know I'm in Wolfpack, but yeah. they'll it'll they'll be wearing a T-shirt or something. Huh? And I'm like, oh, cool. Oh, where'd you get that shirt? Because I don't have any. We none of us have any of our merch, <laughs> really. Right. Because how weird we are. Yeah. Um. <laughs> and it's like, oh, you're a Wolf fan? And I'm like, yeah, I love Wolf. Yeah. You know, and it's true. I love Wolfpack. You know, just to be just to be clear on that. Yeah. But yeah, it was like in my mind, I hadn't really yet realized that the joy and the fulfillment in I think maybe everything we do is found in the process of doing it. Yes. And so it really was down to the time spent. There were like a couple years that were just really intense years for all of us in Wolf because we were trying to navigate how do we handle this demand. And so that became your primary thing that you were doing. It felt energetically and time-wise. Like I also didn't have any good time management skills, so it was the kind of thing where maybe, maybe we only did eight, 12 weeks of yeah. work that year, but I didn't know when it was going to be in the calendar and none of us did because it was kind of popping up in real time. So it would be like, and I didn't really personally as, a, as an adult, I hadn't really gotten to the point where I really could manage my time effectively. So it also it came, out, it came out of college. You guys were kids when it started, right? I mean, yeah, we started out of college and then, you know, about six years into just doing it like once a year, it was like, we got a festival gig and yeah. we're like, oh no, 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 we're not a band. We like literally said, no, 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 we're not a band, you know? Yeah. And they were like, yeah, you are. Yeah. You're a band, you know? <laughs> yep. Now you are. like, oh, wow. That was an amazing time. And I learned so much. And I really, I also had a blast, you yeah. know? But I, I didn't trust myself enough. Like if that happened now, if the Eagles, if you're listening, Joe Walsh, if they were like, hey, you want to come on the road and play drums and sing for like three months? I'd be like, hell yeah, dude. Because I know, I know what I'm doing with my time, you know? Yeah. It wouldn't scare me, you know? But at the time... It was like I just didn't trust myself. I hadn't yeah. I hadn't established my own good work habits, so I was kind of scared about that. But then, then the tour happened. The modern I've worked, yeah. you know, I I I put in the time, and yeah. I like I actually uh, ended up going to Berlin for a month and a half, and I wrote a lot of that album in Berlin, which was an amazing opportunity for me to go. Like I had I had toured Berlin, and yeah. it felt like it was just a special place for me to go. Did you know up, people there? No, not really. I knew I kind of I had one I knew two people there. Yeah. But uh, like we hadn't been close in a long time and then yeah. I met one person and it was like it was really a great experience yeah. for me to put myself out of my comfort zone. And the day I arrived by the way, just so anybody's listening, um the day I arrived I was so I felt like I had made such a mistake cuz I realized like I don't even I don't speak this language. Yeah. And it's like I don't know where I am. People are giving me weird looks, you know, or at least I'm perceiving that. And then it's like I started looking up flights home huh. the day right I away. got there immediately. And then I was like, wait a second. Yeah. Stay here one day. Yeah. And there was like one day became two. And then it was like, after the second day, I was like, oh my God, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah. I think there's a lesson in that. 
you know, when we when we start to walk through the discomfort at the very beginning, it's real bad. Yeah. But that 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 resistance is going to hit very hard. But if you just stay with it yeah. for a second, pretty soon you're like, wow, yeah. I'm free. I'm yeah. empowered. Anyway, I did that and I came back with all this music and I worked on that record and I spent the year doing that. And then it was kind of always, it was kind of this year of like back and forth between me and Wolf. You know, it was like, I do a couple gigs, Wolf would do a huge gig, I do some more gigs. And it was like, you know, back and forth wearing both hats. And then we did the garden and then I had had this tour planned. I went out and did the tour and I, I still didn't trust that people were really coming to see me, to be honest. Sometimes it's like we don't give the audience enough credit in the sense that yeah. if it makes sense to you to be a person who is a like a linear funk drummer and then also writing heartfelt songs. Yeah. That's who you are. Correct. You're a human being. Totally. Then why do point. we why don't we expect that our audience is also capable of appreciating both of those things? Well, I think it's because the mind, the human mind which generates the self Hmm. which is a survival mechanism that we needed for a very long time to make sure that we were liked in the small Stone Age village, <laughs> lest we get left behind to mm -hmm. freeze to death. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what we're designed for. And here we are in modernity with, you know, Instagram yes. going like, do they like me? And basically your mind will, your mind is, you could almost think of it as your mind is there to almost like prevent you from doing anything anything that it thinks might potentially mm. cause you to lose some of that esteem. So it's like your mind is not the place. I've just learned this. Like the mind is not the place to look for any thumbs up. <laughs> you ain't never going to get it. You're like, oh, I don't feel good. It's like, of course, it, you know, so that would be why we don't give the audience enough credit, I'd say, as ourselves. Yes. Now, if you were to do your thing yeah. and ch and it was the same, I'd be like, yeah. Oh, of course. The, no, they'll yeah. totally dig it. Are you kidding yeah. me? But we can't see ourselves because we yeah. we really can't. Yeah. That's not what the self is for. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to break this news, yeah. but this it's not my idea. It's 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 Buddhism basically yes. or something. Yes. You know, it's like it's but I think this is really helpful because I think in order to devote yourself to any true path that's going to require failure because it's a function of doing anything, you need to really get to a place where you're not doing this, you're not waiting for your mind to give you like a thumbs up. You know what I mean? It never will. There has to be something deeper in you that hmm. goes like, you know what? I get up every morning and I do this. Now, yeah. I don't want to pretend like I'm Kobe Bryant level yeah. disciplined because yeah. I'm not, but I saw a clip of him the other day and this would be true for any, you know, elite athlete. Yeah. It, it makes more sense for some reason with athletics to us. We tend to go like, but, you know, we with musicians, we're like, wow, that guy's so talented. But we're pretty sure that Michael Jordan took like 10,000 yeah. shots at the backboard yeah, yeah. by himself. Yeah. You know, we kind of know that he practices. Yeah. <laughs> for some reason with things like singing or songwriting, we think it's just this like gift. gift, which of course it is on a level. But on another level, it's just like being willing to accept this as a path that you are going to pursue. Yes. And you're going to pursue it regardless of the outcome. I'm talking on this microphone, but I'm also talking to myself because myself, which is really two words, I think it's a mistake linguistically. I don't, I'm not an etymologist, but I, it's starting to feel to me like the word myself as one word Should is be a two mistake. Words. It's two words, you know? It's just a this is my the, yeah. self, yes. just like my hand. Yeah, the self of mine. Yeah, this self that I have... Yeah. You know, like anything that you're going to pursue is going to, yeah. that self is going to throw every possible r roadblock it can at the thing that I'm going to call you, yeah. which is not your self. Your self is going to throw all this, these roadblocks at you. Um, this reminds me of the book, The War of Art, yes. which I've talked about before, yeah. but I really want to recommend that to anybody yeah. who's struggling with the self in the realm of really devoting to any endeavor yeah. that they they feel they must do for their soul's evolution yeah. but they're stuck and the reason i recommend that book is that that's the best piece of writing i've come across yeah. for giving you permission to feel like total shit yeah doing this this is not going to be easy it's not going to be fun a lot of the time a lot of time is going to be very painful in a way that nobody understands and you will feel tremendously alone 
But guess what? So does everyone else who's trying to do anything. I mean, you're a parent in addition to an amazing artist and you do all the, all kinds of things. Like, And we don't often, I don't hear a lot of people going, hey, by the way, do you ever feel like tremendously alone as a father? <laughs> but like, I would imagine, oh my God. there's no, there's no rule book for that. Oh there's no handbook. God. And, uh, and you know, and you, you show up with a smile and you're doing your best. And I'm sure other parents look at you like, Hey man, I know what's going on. Like I've, I feel, I see you brother, you know, I can't even connect with you on that level. You know, like I'm not aware of it cause I'm not a, yeah. that's the craziest one. Yeah. It's super deep. I mean, you said something yesterday at Emily King's record presentation that I thought was so interesting. We avoid doing a lot of things as people because we think we're not ready. Yeah. And that is certainly the case f- with many of us before having a family. You know, we, we're mm-hmm. a f- we don't think we're ready to be parents, you know. And sure. But then what you said is you're actually, you, what you've come to believe is that you're actually, you get ready in the doing. 100%. That doing the thing is the preparation for being able to do it. You're not ever going to be there until you do it. Totally, man. Because everything is process. Yes. Right? So then when you realize that, you're like, oh. I guess I literally will never, yeah. ever yeah. feel like I'm there. There's no there. There's just here. There's just here. But I still want to oh, yeah, yeah, try yeah, yeah. to tell a story while, totally. we're in, while in this. So well, this is all relevant because yeah. this is all what I've kind of been dealing with. Been dealing with. Where, where we were is, okay, so you had been sort of feeling this, that like, how is this going to translate? The record came yeah. out. You, you played Brooklyn Steel. You sold it out 2020. Yeah. yeah, a lot of those tour dates were sold out on the yeah. 2020 tour. And yeah. then the world shut down and I was depressed with a capital D yeah. full stop. And it was pretty easy for everyone I talked to in my life to yeah. say, oh, well, you know, everyone's depressed because, you know, COVID and like, yeah, look at, I mean, your tour got canceled. And I, and I sort of took that like, oh yeah, but I knew that wasn't it. it was I else. knew it was deeper. I knew it was that I was running in a race with myself and my Wolfpack self and my, you know, what are people going to think of me? Am I good enough? Am I a good Mm. enough songwriter? You know, I had pushed myself so hard for so long. I didn't have anything left in that tank. So like when COVID hit, I try, started, you know, getting to the piano, getting the guitar, just like working. And I thought, oh, I'm built for this shit. Like I'm a musician. We can practice all day. All we want is to be left alone. Yeah, yeah. Wee hee. But it was like, that lasted for about half a day, you know? And then I was like, when I realized that I had nothing left in the, Sorry for the violent analogy, but like jam a, jam a pistol in my face and go, hey, listen up, listen up, motherfucker. Like, you're going to write this damn song. And you still didn't. I had nothing left in that tank. Like, I had been so hard on myself for so long. And I don't want to pretend like I had no joy in all this, in all this stuff, but because I did, I always did. But there was just this like self competitive motivator. And I think people can ride that a very long time. Some people ride that all the way. I mean, I watched the last dance that Michael Jordan documentary. Yeah. It seems like Jordan rode that to all the way totally. through his career. I, th- I am not a psychologist, and I don't know what it's like at all. So much of my life and motivation and, I don't know, the mechanism that I have been using is my relationship with my father. He's very much alive and in my life. Yeah, I, man. I play him everything I write. I send him everything I do. It's not necessarily approval at this point, but mm-hmm. it has become, I almost feel like there are no consequences in my life because my dad is alive. It's beautiful, man. And his dad died when he was in his 20s. Mm. And my dad, I've always seen, has been obsessively creating and making stuff to make sure that what he leaves behind is more substantial than what his dad left behind, which was unrealized no potential. No doubt. Your father didn't leave unrealized potential behind. He played on a lot of records. Yeah. He did a lot of shit. But he left at a time when you hadn't yet been able to yeah, actualize. show him what you could do. Totally. That's, that's actually the way to say it. Yeah. There's a part of me that's just been watching you the whole time going like, I wonder what, <laughs> what he's thinking about his dad. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. I mean, I... When I, when I found that there was nothing left in the tank, I had felt it coming for a while. I had, and I, I was like, I'll just get through this tour, you know, this mean, and, then I'll, and then I'll deal with it. And mm-hmm. when I found that there was nothing left in the tank, I had to really question what the motivation was to begin with, you know, because I've been playing music so long. And I was like, oh, I'm the music guy. I was the music kid in high school, whatever. And I kept going deeper into yeah. that over like, 
the forced it really wasn't until I went to Michigan. So I was in LA till about October and I was I was producing uh Rhett Madison's first album, which mm-hmm. I'm super proud of. And she's just one of the best songwriters I know and and a truly one of my biggest inspirations as in terms of what it means to tell the truth in mm. song. Like it's 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 painful shit, man. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. real shit. And she sings her ass off. I mean, she rips the room to shreds. Mm-hmm. From for my dough, like Rhett Madison is like a lightning bolt. Like yeah. everybody go take note here. You know, that's that's my feeling. And she's a joyful, amazing, happy soul as well. And like she's telling the truth in her songs, you know. I was fifteen when I had my first drink. Numb on the sofa across from a shrink. Keeping my mouth shut and grinding my teeth. I got away as far as I could, but that didn't do me any good. This hurricane's within me. So I was in LA working on her record, and then yeah. <clears throat> we finished up around October of. 2020 and i i just got in my van and drove to michigan i felt like i need to go back to kind of my roots which i'm from new york but i spent most of my 20s a lot of my 20s in michigan so i i felt like i'm going back there did you buy a van from a kid on craigslist man that whole song is true (laughs) it's autobiographical (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, i bought a I bought a van i mean he was 19 yeah that counts right yeah sure Teenage teenage kid teenager and he had his shit together it was amazing it was like wow you like own a van and like you fix the van and you work on cars and you bought it so you could like go on camping trips with your girlfriend i'm like this guy's really got his shit together yeah i'm gonna take some notes on this fucking guitar player in la trying to figure out what's wrong with me yeah So I got in the van and I drove to Michigan and it wasn't until I got to Michigan and I had enough space, like physical space outdoors. Basically, a, a really dear friend of mine offered me a, a place at a cabin in the woods and uh, Seth Bernard, another one of my favorite songwriters and important artist in my life, important person in my life in Michigan. He 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 offered me this place to stay that had a piano mm-hmm. and I sort of, I was a little scared because like, well, I don't really like the piano right now you know i'm not sure i can touch that thing like i'm not sure what i'm even doing with music i don't even know why i play music i was pretty lost i took the invitation was very grateful for it got to this farm basically i'm alone in nature and i start asking this question like what why am i doing this you know what is this for and i really couldn't answer it and i i talked to a couple you know a therapist a, a coach I had a coaching session with Seth that was really powerful for me. He started out, I told him like, man, I'm, I'm lost, you know? And, and we started, he started asking questions and we got to this kind of root. It was like, man, I am trying to please my dad, <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, you, you, uh, you're, he's nodding, you're <laughs> nodding right now as I say it, but it's like, I realized at that moment that probably a lot of people could see this yeah. from a mile away. And yeah. I was literally, huh talking to the, a therapist and she's going, so what's going on? And I'm going, well, 
for some reason I'm I'm stuck feeling like I for some reason I care so much what people think of my music, but to be honest, I don't give a shit at all. You know what I mean? Like both are true. Yes. What's going on with that? Yeah. Huh. And she asked me, she's like, Well, who are you trying to get approval from? And I, I couldn't I had no idea. And then she's like, Let me ask that differently. Who are you trying to get to love you? And I just mm. just immediately and that waterworks. Was the turn. That was the turn. Yeah. That and I realized like, oh, I associated like love from my dad with yeah. like if I could just show him that I'm like got can, some sauce, I, I man. Can I can really do the thing. Yeah. And I don't know if that's just the way I mean, the way a, a boy is with his father or way I was certainly the way I was with my dad. And my dad was so loving to me. You know what I mean? It, like I didn't really have a reason that I knew how to identify in that moment. Like, why would I have felt this way? Whereas my mom, you know, I felt like she really saw me. Yeah. And that's ultimately, you know, that started a journey of like some real healing work, like in the spiritual, yeah. psychological space. And I mean, the Wim Hof method was a humongous part of that. I haven't really talked about it publicly, but like I sing about, uh, I sing about it a little bit, veiled a little bit, but still sing about it on the, um, on the album. But like psilocybin mushrooms as well. I had a psilocybin mushroom ceremony that was profound for me where I was able to, you know, really do some work within my spirit with my dad, who's been gone for a decade, but I really was able to, I'm not just saying this, and I, I mean, it, yeah. I know it sounds crazy possibly, but I was really able to heal some of this and really see the root of it. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to pretend like, uh, I want to be very clear that the plant medicines and and different medicines that have that are that are of this this natural world they've been used for millennia by us humans they have been used in religious sacred contexts they are not for partying i mean hmm. maybe there's a way to party with them but i'm yeah. not i'm not interested in that i'm yeah. not talking about drug use yeah i'm talking about really doing your best effort to like go to the source of your pain and like sit with it and it is painful to do that you mm -hmm. know i'm not even trying to talk about it like i'm i'm a tough guy i'm yeah. not a tough guy i mean that that shit ripped me in half yeah you know but it was the most healing one of the most healing things most painful day of my life i i, I just talked about it on the way here yeah with an old friend and and we were we were crying about it yeah. because uh <clears throat> you know she was asking and she was interested and i just think we all carry all this shit that we pick up in our childhoods and we don't even know where the hell we got it, Yeah, you know, but it's there. And yeah. it's like, until you, and I'm not saying you need to go do mushrooms, but yeah. that was part of my journey. And I, I can't think of an, a reason to be a professional musician with visibility if I don't talk about the real shit. But also because of how much honesty, that, that's, a, that's a big question. You know, you don't have to talk about anything if you don't want to you bury your soul in the music you know yeah songs are all veiled you know what i mean people I, I've, yeah. written, I've written songs that i think are extremely clear mm -hmm. and then people are completely misunderstanding what i said but same fine same. let Even them on have this that. record i'm like shocked you know <laughs> but let them have it that's yes, their experience it. with it it's magic and i i think it's important as a songwriter not to fall into the trap of being yeah. like telling the audience oh this is about this this is about this because then you kind of limit what they can what they experience. can think of it as, yeah. On the other hand, what I guess what I'm saying is like, yes, you know, your whole position is I'm going to be honest here. I'll, really, what you're offering, like, I think a lot of what I was thinking about with your songs today is like, you sing your ass off, you play your ass off. The craft of songwriting, like, is all there. The presentation, the performance is amazing, but it's all a Trojan horse to get to some real authentic truth. Hell yeah, I love like, that you feel that happening. way. That's what I'm aiming for, man. I'm really, really could not be more stoked that that's how that's hitting you because that's 100% my aim. I mean, that's what me, that's like sort of the magic of song. I mean, if I think about like Bob Marley, you know, get up, stand up, mm -hmm. stand up for your rights. Ooh, that's nice and funky. Did you hear what he just said? <laughs> yeah. And we're stand all up for that. your rights. You know what I'm saying? Don't give up the fight. This is a real serious message. Yeah. Or Buffalo Soldier. Yeah. This is about the pain of slavery, man. It is like so sing songy. And that's the genius, that's the magic yeah. of song. If you yeah. can figure out how to use, or I mean, I've said this before, but only the good die young, mm -hmm. Billy Joel. Mm -hmm. Only the good die young. Yeah. Like, 
heavy lyric. Yes. The whole it, that whole song is extremely intense. And the uh, the legend I heard was that he wrote that, and then Paul Simon walked in the room and was like, it was like a, a slow ballad. I don't yeah. know if you have any insight on this. Don't. I, I don't even remember where I heard this, so I'm I'm sorry if I'm spreading false information here. But either way, it's helpful as a, as a a reminder that like music. The harmony, the sonics of it, the yeah. sound yes. can be very joyful, yes. which is almost like the honey that you put into my mm-hmm. throat medicine drops mm-hmm. that I took at the beginning of the podcast, yes. which was bitter. Yes. It allows me to take the medicine. Yes. It's like we need that sometimes. Totally. There are certain things you cannot say unless you wrap this pig in a blanket. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, and I think that's what's so interesting about... Yes, about, in general, what you're writing is that people, you're one of those writers who people may not realize what they're even nodding along to or what they're going yeah, along with. Yeah, yeah. Um, I love that about it, man. I love it. So there's a song on this record that I think speaks to something that you did live through. We all lived through isolation in which our only point of contact with the rest of the world happened on social media. Yeah. And we also became increasingly fired up in our little corners about what information we cared about and what we thought about. And yeah. and people started really fighting with each other. I mean, maybe I'm misreading that song, but there's no. a song about basically that says, look, I mean, how is it possible we've lost all the nuance in the way we talk to each other and now we're fighting a war, 10 years of friendship down the drain because I clicked a button on my computer. Yeah. Click of a button and now we're fighting a war Each on an island Totally silent But oh The feeling Nailed it, man. Yeah, the only chance we have is the name of the song. When we fall off of the high horse, baby Onto the track Face down Yeah, I'm glad you took that from it. I think I think that one's pretty clear, and it's yeah. it's kind of funny to watch the Spotify numbers sort of reflect the degree of pain. It's like people don't click no. like a woman scorned to listen to very often because it's a little too painful. Interesting. I think. I mean, maybe I'm misreading that, but similarly with that song, but the but the comments, if you will, are all like, "Wow, man, oof," you know, because it's like if you're gonna listen, then that's gonna hurt. Because that hurts. Because that message hurts. And, and there's no way around it. Yeah. And I I feel compelled or called. I mean, I'm not trying to tell anyone how to live. I think yeah. art is really like, if you have to say something because it's coming out of you, such that if you don't say it, you're going to lose your damn mind, mm-hmm. then please share, share, you know, yeah. make your art. Yeah. Like, please. Yeah. You know, it's a service yeah. to humanity for you to not go absolutely insane because you're holding yes. your truth back, you know? So, and that's true for all of us, whether we, quote, succeed in the music business or not, or whatever you're doing. I'm I'm here for health, for health. and For healing. your own health. For my own health and for the hopefully, you know, something we say before the show, I'll get back to the yeah. question too, but yeah. something we say before the show a lot in our group huddle is like, we're here to inspire. Yes. And... Who am I to be in a position to inspire? I mean, I had to, I have to consistently get over that. And you know what? It's an unanswerable question because, again, it's the self. So rather than go, who am I? Yeah. How about you say, I'm nobody. It doesn't matter that it's me, but, oh, crap, turns out here I am. I'm here for so this. So what am I going to do with it? I tell people, when I talk to younger musicians, I'm like, if you find yourself on a stage yeah. exalted, literally... 10 feet above everyone else like a god yeah please don't let that space of the stage be a place where you do anything other than give your fullness yeah. because you're not it's not a great place to hide dude because you're <laughs> on stage everyone can see you and they came to see you because they would love to be inspired mm. so it's almost like that's the only gig and i think with mm. i think with jazz school a little bit Mm. Nothing against jazz school in principle, but I think some of the hyper focus of the technicality of some of the musicianship has the potential in any in any academic endeavor to lose the connection to like 
guess what? Jazz is real music too. It's inspirational music. This is spiritual music. So is all the great music. That's still the goal. It just doesn't matter what it sounds like. Yeah. That's why I can be into screamo punk and Coltrane yeah. and John Mayer. Yeah. Okay? Or whatever. It doesn't matter what the yeah. what the genre is or the even I don't even really care what it sounds like if I can feel the feeling. The thing. Yeah. That was a sidebar, but um with the only chance we have I'm I'm trying to remember what the original question was, but the well, I was just filling in the space like you're out there, you've taken mushrooms, you've discovered Wim Hof, and I actually want to ask you specifically about Wim Hof. Yeah. Anyway, you get out there, you're doing the the coaching session, the therapy, you're realizing yeah. what you're aiming for. Like, oh, yeah. wait, I need to shed this. Like, I need I to shed this, and I and I want to be clear that I had to take some space away. Yeah. So I sort of, in a way, was lucky that there was a forced break because I was about to burn out anyway, and. During that time, like I, I allowed myself to put music down because mm. I just couldn't. I didn't know how to touch it. I couldn't hold it. Like the, I, I was like, I had no clue if I was doing this for myself or if I was just doing this to please my dad, you know. And so I was like, all right, I'm gonna devote basically all my energy towards my healing journey right now, and I'm gonna, because I, because if I'm ever gonna do this again, it's gonna have to be for a reason that I can identify. <laughs> And that's that's pure to me. Not that there's not there's so much beauty in trying to please my dad, but the the joke is he already loved me no matter what. He literally told me all the time, and even told me he didn't. He would say, "I don't give a shit if you work at McDonald's if you do what the fuck you want to do with your life." My dad would say that stuff to me. Pardon the expletives, but he was like one of the most passionate people yeah. I've ever, no bullshit guys I've ever met, and yeah. he would tell me that. But I had to go through that, and I once I let myself get quiet enough, music just came yeah you know what i'm saying it just it was like oh wow and the first the first time it came back i was like a little nervous mm -hmm. what if i touch the piano and i don't like it and i beat myself up again you know and i just try to be gentle 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 and i sort of gentled my way into hmm. this record like writing this record was i it took a lot of work what were the first songs that came i had some ideas that were developing over the over a while you know and i sort of was writing a lot in 2019 i guess and before the tour i had some stuff that was like in this pile of songs you yeah. know how, how you kind of collect those and i kind of didn't want to use any of them i was like okay i'm starting over you know what i mean totally and the first the first song that i don't know if this was the first one that came period or if it was just the it was the first one that like when i found it i i had found it in this new gentler way yeah and that was be the wheel yeah and i was like when that song was when i found that chorus i was like all right man i'm gonna make an album And then it was like, oh, actually, this one that I wrote six yeah. months ago is is completely in line. I was yeah. already kind of going yeah. that way. And then others came, yeah. you know, it all kind of flowed out from there. Can you talk about what Be The Wheel means? What the origin of that yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. We are on the verge of uh, a number of technological civilization altering changes. Yes. And I'm sure I sound like a lunatic talking about that, but... In case it wasn't completely obvious, like we're all playing with chat GPT and it's like, yeah. wow, it's so crazy. It's a lot more than crazy. We're going that way. Yeah. Like AI is AI is here. Uh the car will drive itself. Um, once the car drives itself, then are we gonna need parking lots? Because if the car drives itself, then the actual amount that the car is utilized in terms of its total shelf life is yeah. more like 95% of its life as opposed to the current like 5 to 10% of mostly cars don't get Sick. driven. So what happens to car ownership? What happens to the industry that is the automotive industry? Do the car do the what what happens to 30% of LA is just parking? You know, what are we going to do? Like 
these changes are massive, and I didn't come up with these ideas. There's a there's an amazing book I recommend called The Price of Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's by a man named Jeff Booth, who um, is a really brilliant thinker. For anybody interested in um, where we're going technologically, I think that's a really important mm -hmm. book. So I was just getting kind of... I mean, I was it was COVID, and I was you know I was alone in and the woods, going deep. I was going deep, and I I sort of hit on this like notion because these civilization the wheel is one of those changes. The wheel is something that is emergent in nature, but it took humanity a while to figure it out. We humanity like didn't use a wheel for most of yeah. our lives, yeah. But once we had it. We could move things across land, and then we had all these civilizational changes as a result of the wheel, as a result of the ability to harness fire, as the result of the ability to harness gravity's effect on water, which is, just, you know, the aqueduct. Mm -hmm. These are huge changes, and I kind of became obsessed for a while with the history of that. And then one day I was sitting at the piano, and it was like, here comes the hurricane. It's blowing, babe. Yeah. And there goes the automobile. Yeah. Don't be the horse and buggy be the wheel like don't get don't get it twisted don't get distracted yeah. with the current iteration yeah look for the deeper thing yeah and also part of what's going on there is like the wheel rolls man so when we say go with the flow like that's what the wheel does you know that's what clyde stubblefield used to say i grew up in, and clyde was my teacher and my my mentor in madison he lived in for madison. real dude oh, oh yeah i did not realize and he that. used to say oh let, my God. let the wheel roll that's was his wow. that was his phrase let the wheel roll. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. tremendous. But as a drummer also think about like for him momentum was the real wheel rolling. And that's one of those things that is very Clyde Stubblefield is yeah. like there's the momentum is always there. Yeah. Don't worry about the mechanism that it's the wheel is the asset. At the end yes. of the day the wheel is the thing that matters. That's the thing. Exactly, man. So I'm very hesitant to give a directive linguistically in songwriting but you like, do say don't be but i this. say don't and i felt like i really had to sit with that i was like no that's right yeah and i also did it on the song hit the target yes i'm like put that down yeah pick this up yeah These things started to feel like deeper yeah. spiritual concepts to me. Is like, you know, hit the target is I, again. What's it about? Well, I don't know. But what it <laughs> what it comes from for me is this like there's this frustration with the madness of life that can come through sometimes. Yeah. Where you're like, I screw this up. I screw this relationship up. I don't have the physique I want. I don't like my songs. I don't whatever. Ad nauseum, ad infinitum, yeah. forever and ever, amen. Yes. Again, the self, the mind yeah. is running this thing endlessly. Yes. I was again thinking about this um, through the lens of technology, which, by the way, I'm thrilled to find out that I have not alienated people with this music because I was, I was kind of not sure how far out I was. <laughs> I was like studying all this history stuff. I was like, am I writing like a historical concept record yeah. like i really hope i'm not yeah. you know what i mean and yeah. i was so thrilled to people be like oh be the wheel man yeah. <laughs> i try to be like yeah enough of a song sing yeah. zone that i can enjoy it yeah you know even though there's some, some stuff underneath i it wanted there maybe... to be depth yeah. but simple and i yeah. i feel that i found that so that's the feedback i'm getting which yeah. is great but in terms of hit the target it was like this frustration if you think about the anger and frustration that people have of course they they have that's natural but then we have this technology, which is like the gun. Yeah. You could just shoot somebody. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. We're not supposed to have the gun, you know? The yeah. gun is a... I'm say, when I say you're not supposed to, I mean, it's not It's not a part of the human design. You're we didn't not just, supposed we didn't to be able to... We didn't just pick it up and we had no. to invent it. We had to create it. Yeah. You're not supposed to be able to pull a button and end a life. It's too easy. It's too easy to take your own life. You know what I'm saying? And so it's having all this dangerous... We're wreaking havoc all over this world. And I'm not interested in getting into the yeah. gun debate. I'm just yeah. talking about yeah, yeah. it occurred to me one day because I took up archery. Yeah. And I noticed one day I was like, wow, you can't really pull this back and shoot yourself. Mm. Now, I wasn't going to try, but I was just noticing like you pull this thing. It takes a lot of effort. You take aim and you need to hold it and you need to really try to nail this. 
because you got one shot. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And now I know that the bow and arrow is also a piece of technology that yeah. we that we weren't born with. Yes. But it's harder. It takes more time. There's more effort. You need mm -hmm. to be more intentional about what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So it occurred to me like, no, you got you got that anger. You need to like get that weapon thing out. Put the gun down, bro. Mm -hmm. Like put pick up the bow and arrow and hit the target. Hmm. That's what that thing's for. I mean, yeah. I don't. I'm I'm a vegan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Yeah, yeah. But like, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to hunt. And, and no disrespect yeah. to the hunters either. Yeah. I, I respect that. But I I I don't. I just shoot archery for for the for the uh, mental focus and and yes. enjoyment of it. But it was like there's something. I was talking to myself. It's like, hey, harness. You know, yeah. Through the sea of this mental confusion, you have focus. Yes. And hit the target. And it's kind of insane when you think about hitting a target from however far away. It's, it's, it's as insane as hitting a three-point shot yeah. at the buzzer. It's like, yeah. how can you do that? It's impossible, and yet it happens all the time. You know, Right. That's true. That's absolutely true. But it's the difference of whether or not you're really focusing. Yes. I don't know if you saw this video of me accidentally shooting an arrow through my phone. Through your phone. I did that like I was just frustrated one day. I was like, man, I suck at the internet. Like, Fuck this. And I was like, It's got to yeah. be one of your biggest videos. Uh, yeah, <laughs> totally. And I was like, man, you know what? And I had, I had just, uh, kind of let, let it all out to my, to my friend. And he was, he was like, man, it's all good, bro. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go make a promo video. Fuck this shit. You know, walk outside. He's like, what happens if you hit your phone? I'm like, ah, I'm not going to hit my phone. And I look right at the phone. I hadn't shot the, the bow in months pulled it back, looked right at it, and I just shot through its heart. And it was like, because my energy was completely focused on it. And it was like, whoops, I didn't look above it. I looked right at it. And in that moment of frustration, it was kind of funny because it was like it was like this cosmic joke of like, well, now you screwed your phone. Now you destroyed your phone, so now you need to buy a new phone, dummy. It's like an $800 <laughs> mistake that you made. But yeah. But you okay, so you have been. So here's where we see you today before you went out on yeah, the road. Yeah, yeah. Shirtless in the snow in the woods. Yeah. Pounding your chest was that for the corn does yeah, grow yeah, that yeah, video. Yeah, you're yeah, like yeah. out there like bear when you talk about burying your soul in your songs, but you're like burying it all physically also. <laughs> and you've put yourself through a lot of physical st yeah. stress. But yeah. I mean, the, the ice bath thing is like yeah. you, you you just casually said to me yesterday, you know the thing about these ice baths is that they never get easier. I think your your ability to surrender to the ice improves. So in that sense, like you could think of it like, oh, it's getting easier. Yeah. But I'm just saying the like the walk to the yeah. ice is always scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just as scary. Every time. Every single time. So I didn't read the book Breathe or Breath. I haven't read it yet, but I've been I've been gifted two yeah. by two different people yeah. copies. So yeah. it's um it's on <laughs> it's next. But I know like that it's interesting when things just sort of take hold in culture where certain yeah. ideas come forward. And so I had never anyway. So then I did, I just did some casual Wim Hof like videos and then I was doing it, you know, for about a year. I was like, I was doing the thing, but you know, totally isolated by myself. I like, didn't take his course or anything. I just like watched him do some videos, no, great. learned how to do the holds, started taking colder showers, like got that far into it, you know? Beautiful, man. So then I see you get out with Wolf in the, in the middle of a concert, get into an ice bath and sing a song. I was like, I know what he's doing. Like, yeah, I know man. where he's coming from. That's awesome. How did you find that? And what is the relationship? I mean, you became, yeah. you studied with him. You went to work with him. Yeah, I studied. I went to, uh, I've been to two of his retreats yeah. in Europe. I mean, I'm lucky, luckily I was able to, to do that. Yeah. And I feel very fortunate. Um, but I will say, Wim, Wim would be the last guy to tell you, to, to say you needed to go work with him in order to do this. Yeah. You know, he... He just, he just wants everybody to, you know, get into the breath work and take take a cold shower, get in the ice. He's a very, yeah, he's he's not a businessman, even though he's he has helped steward the understanding of this. But he is kind of a cult cult of personality on some level. Absolutely, I'm and he's aware of that, and I th I feel he's using that effectively because he's that's who he really is. Yeah, I mean, Wim is like the mo one of the most boundless. I've never met anybody like Wim. He's He's singing all day. Huh. He's playing guitar all day. He's playing djembe all day. Is he a good musician? Yes. Beautiful singer. Amazing voice. Huh. Full heart. Like, real like... Ah, he's got like... I can't even do it, but he's got like... Opera an kind of thing or... Operatic, but not like 
opera with a capital O, yeah. just like he sings in many languages. Yeah. He speaks nine languages. He's a, he's a student of life and a really he believes in empowering people, you know, and he's and he has been able to use his gift of his fearlessness and his crazy physical abilities to like let people know that this essentially free i mean if you have access to cold water and you have access to your own breath Mm -hmm. you can do some tremendous uh healing work within your body and and your spirit and your mind so i feel like it's changed my life man in a great way the instagram algorithm is now starting to feed me the sort of haterade for the (laughs) really yeah well you know how it is it's like oh you like ice baths like everybody you look at next day is ice baths and the next day it's like yeah, this ice bath shit is, you know, whatever. And it's like, Interesting. I'm not interested in, I don't really care whether somebody is going to talk smack on any of the things I'm talking about. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> I'm much more interested in like trying to um, promote things that I feel are really, truly positive for people. And my journey started on a personal level. I just was, I saw a friend do this. Yeah. I saw a friend, we all jumped into the, so you saw the ice thing before the breathing? Yes. I saw the cold. I basically saw a friend of mine. We all jump into a frozen lake for one second. Yeah. Immediately out. Oh, that was crazy. Yeah. You know, bunch of us. And then dry off. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, wow, I feel kind of warm now. Yeah. That's that's crazy. Like yeah. nobody ever told me that, you know, which which is, has yeah. real reasons. Physically, yeah. your body's now, you know, warming yourself up yeah. after the cold exposure. Like, wow, that's cool. And then I look over... Five minutes later, I was just laughing yeah. with my friends, and like my one friend Justin is still in the water, he's, he's still out there, and he's completely relaxed. And it was like, I felt like I was, it was like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. You know, like this guy's bending reality. There's yeah. no way in hell he's this relaxed because yeah. I'm freaking out. Yeah, you know. So then I just asked him, I'm like, is that what is that? And he told me about Wim and yeah. my friend Seth, who I mentioned earlier, it also yeah told me about Wim. So. It was like how these things in life start to kind of find you. Yeah. And then you hear about it like 10 times in a week. Yep. And you're like, I got to check this out. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I was near some cold water in Michigan. So I went in, but I didn't know any of the practice. So I was kind of just toughing it out. And I wasn't able to do it for very long because the secret is you can't tough it. The ice is a surrender practice. No one is able to tough it out. The strongest dude in the world can't tough it out. It's a relax into it thing but once i started doing the breath work i was like just moved to tears with how with the changes i was experiencing in my mental health and my my physical body i was able to do three times as many push-ups as i've ever done but without breathing yeah. while holding my breath yeah. what the hell just happened to me yeah. i mean I, I i fell to yeah. the ground and cried because i was like i <laughs> What the hell is going on? Yeah. I just did 65 push-ups yeah. and like while my max was 30. While holding your breath. But I wasn't even breathing. You yeah. know, it was like, it was it was wild. And then and then I started, you know, really getting <clears throat> serious about the cold exposure. And I went to the retreat and we ended the week with a 15-minute ice bath. And I had like the most profound moment of like presence I've ever had in my life. It felt like extremely psychedelic and had you, already, had you already done the mushrooms i had and it was i don't want to pretend like the yeah. ice was like i wasn't tripping yeah but i was like i saw a white light i saw a hole open up in the sky like a white light and i it moved towards my face and and my face went into the hole and i was on the threshold i felt like mm. it was like and i i saw my end of life regrets like I got three messages of... This is in the ice bath? Yes. Are these regrets that represented things that have not yet happened to you, do you think? Yes. I'll tell you what they were. And I also want to say, you know, I don't know. This is an experiment. Here I am, experiment in vulnerability, you know? Best case scenario is that a lot of people hear this, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. I, don't, I don't necessarily, just a moment of on yeah. vulnerability, I don't yeah. necessarily think that everybody is has earned... A, a, your your vulnerability, you know, but I, you know what I mean. That's a deep thing to say to earn your vulnerability. Well, I'm saying like, 
I think there's a difference between being vulnerable and oversharing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? No, I do. And I've sat with this stuff for a very long time and I've thought about whether it could possibly help somebody. I'm not interested in having like a public cult of personality life where I'm like telling everybody everything. It's not, that's not what I want. To me, the reason it's relevant is because what I'm interested in is people's personal experiences and the work that emerges out of it, that intersection mm. between our lives and our work. In as much that I'm visible, I've decided I want it to be something that I seems like it's has the chance to bring joy to yeah. joy and healing to people. Yeah. And so I think this qualifies. The three regrets were they showed up as I didn't mean to. Mm. The first one I I don't even know if it was auditory or visual. It was like I was in a full weeping in the bath. Really the crying bath. hard. This is before the white light came. I was I was like in so much physical pain that I was I think what happened, I, I wasn't actually going to die, but I felt like my body thought I was going to die, I guess. Or like I started to get this real f crazy level of like sadness that I had never Has anyone ever died in the, in, in the retreats or in the baths? That you're, I mean, no, not in the retreats, yeah. no. I, I mean, they won't, They are all medical, you know, they're first aid. Yeah, 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 they're watching you like a hawk, and they're really, really supportive. Yeah. And, and um, But you're in there, your body's that. like in a certain kind of shock where it's like it's starting to do the things that it, it might do if it thinks that you're going. I think, I mean, I, I was just in this, I felt this emotional, it's very emotional. I mean, it's pretty much everybody's crying at this point. Yeah. People are crying and they're, but they're not really crying from the pain. They're crying because at first it's pain, but then it's like, it's cracking to the heart of the, of the, the pain, the, the spiritual pain or the emotional trauma or whatever yeah. you've got in there. The ice will find it. You know, similarly to mushrooms, I feel. Mm -hmm. But um, so the first one was I didn't mean to not go for it. I didn't mean to not go I for it. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to not go for it. And it was like, hmm. I was just cry I was crying, weeping through that because my body was, my, my life was telling me like, hey, you're still kind of not going for it, dude. But you, you thought, thought you, you were. You think you are. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was like, whoa, I thought I was. And it was like, yeah. I didn't mean to not go for it. And I was just crying yeah. through yeah. that, you know? And then yeah. I and then I got, I didn't mean to let my fear of what other people might think of me prevent me from going mm -hmm. for it. And then the third one was, I didn't mean to not open my heart up to a woman. Mm. That was how it showed itself. Mm. And I have before, and I, I intend to again, but it was like, I got out of that ice bath, man. And once I warmed up, it was like, I guess I know what I have to do with my life now. <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Don't, which the first two yeah. are almost the same. Yeah. But it was why I wasn't yeah. going for it. Yeah. Because that was important. Go for it. Don't worry what people think of you. Yeah. For doing it and open your heart to a, to a partner. To, to a, a partner. Yeah. yeah. Which for me is a woman, but yeah. I mean as a partner, yeah, you yeah. know, like to, to open your heart to love. And it was just, I, it, in retrospect, I can't believe I was 15 minutes away from, from that. being absolutely certain what I'm supposed to do with my life. <laughs> like you're saying, like for the for the last 30, however many years, you were with you were just 15 minutes away from yeah. that information. So when people are like, "Now I don't know that that happens to everyone," yeah, but seeing the ice crack a hundred people in half, you know, like the the people on those retreats come back with like. A really, and we stay in touch. We're on yeah. a th group thread, and we people maybe wax and wane a little bit with the pra with the practice. So, how do you manage all the practice stuff? You got a lot of practices to integrate yeah. in your life. Well, I know, and I'm I'm definitely not doing everything I want to be doing. <laughs> yeah, but you're on the road. It's hard. It's hard. To yeah, do. it's the the breath work is every day for me. The holds. What they call the Wim Hof method protocol breathing. Um, I'm very interested in other modalities of breath work too. I know there are many. But that's the one I know, yeah. and I'm loving it. So that's every day for me, the 30 to 40 deep breaths, fully in, and then letting go of the exhale. And then after the final one, a full exhale and then breath retention, breath hold, no breathing in until you need to. Do you time it? I do. This is so bro -y, but like... No, great. One thing when I was doing it, I'll say, is that was interesting, and I think actually almost like a metaphor for our lives, I guess, is like... Just because you held it long yesterday, it might not be there for you today. True. That was what was happening to me anyway. Same, same. Is that still the case? Yes. I find it very 
tied to my like my ability to uh tap into like a basic mental calm if i'm like super all over the place in my brain i'll do the breathing and it will be very helpful but i'll notice usually the retentions are not as long yeah surprise there's a connection between the mind and body like mm-hmm. of course there is you yeah. know we just we just live in this materialist world that's like trying to like yep. specialize into like every possible but of course this whole system and all this life it's is inter- holistic it's a symphony it's like mm-hmm. everybody's playing a part every entity there's trillions of entities in your own body when you factor in all the uh you know cells bacteria parasite fungi virus i got off the tangent oh yeah, yeah. so my longest holds. Yeah, my longest hold I've ever done has been three and a half minutes. Fucking long. But I have only done that once. Yesterday I did three minutes. Good for you. On my third round. Usually so you do three me, cycles? I do three cycles at minimum um, is my practice. Is that 15 minutes? 15, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. If you're holding three minutes, then... Yeah, it's it's usually about 15 minutes. Yeah. But uh, if I if I really need it, I mean, I'll do five, six rounds. When we did the retreat, we did it. We did the rounds for an hour and a half, man. And One he, day. when I saw the video of him doing it, it was like, oh, this, this is intense breathing. This isn't like, Very when you intense. read it, you're like, mm-hmm. deep breath in, deep breath out. No, no. When you hear him do it, yeah. then the intensity of the inhale is Yes. Like, We're not used to any of this stuff, you know? We don't, we don't live in a culture that is a, that does this. So it's kind of scary sometimes yeah. for people where they're like, I feel a little lightheaded and yeah. it's totally normal, yeah, yeah. but makes sense that you'd feel a little bit afraid wim's uh famous phrase is get high on your own supply <laughs> yeah no it is it it's is like getting high it reminded me of nitrous the first time i did it i don't know if you mm, ever if you ever did that in regrettably yeah, one time yeah don't but, do it <laughs> no no i mean but in that i know, that, I know. That kind of <laughs> like, yeah i mean it was the dumbest thing in the world <clears throat> yeah and, yeah but this yeah this it kind of gave gave you that similar like high yeah thing the only reason i say regrettably yeah. is like i want to be very clear to any yeah. i'm so glad that my generation of musicians doesn't come from a drug culture. It's a waste of your life to be addicted yeah. to drugs, man. Yeah. It's just not good, not good, bad, bad, not good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't mean that there's no place for exploring consciousness. And I, I certainly have now admitted that I've, I've used psychedelics, but specifically mushrooms is like, that's something that comes from nature that has a long history of uh with sort of ritualistic containers held yeah. for that kind of work it's ego relinquishing medicine yeah we know this now we've seen the research in yeah. like johns hopkins and whatever the wow. michael pollan yeah, yeah, uh, the book, book yeah. and documentary how yeah. to change your mind the, yeah. the psilocybin episode is is really worth watching yeah the aim for this stuff for me is to like uk you use this as a tool and then you kind of once you have that experience that you've lived through you're like wow i had no ego for a while if you could kind of tap into the quality of that and remember bring it you can really find that you can bring it to more of your life so the answer about the the whim practice is like i do the breath work every day and i do some some kind of cold exposure every day Mm. but i can't always currently on tour get an ice bath yeah i was going to suggest a place to you today actually i almost did what are you going to suggest there's this place that my friend just went to the other day out on Sunset Park or a little further out and Dude, I just heard about this place. And it's multiple I have a bunch yeah, of different I've got rooms. I've got a couple spots in New York that yeah. I like. I'm hoping to actually go after this. Oh, you're gonna go out there? <clears throat> oh well, I'm gonna go I think I'm gonna go to one in Manhattan. Yeah. But um if I can't get the ice bath, I still take a cold shower. Yeah. And some of the showers aren't that cold, but some of them are really cold. If I can do the the real ice every day, I will. Like in the winter, I, I was in Michigan for a lot of this winter yeah. and I did I did it every day. There's a special bath that you can get, right? Or that there's a special actual device that you can order. There's a number of devices. Yeah. The only portable one that I know of is Edge Theory Labs, uh-huh. which which I was, which is a really nice bunch of folks who have made this uh, portable inflatable tub that goes down to 34 degrees, oh which God. is no joke. And um, I was actually going to partner with them for this tour, but. I realized like because the size of the venues is not yeah. consistent, like it would be very difficult to consistently use it because some of these places don't have a shower or don't really have a green room. But then the other places do, like Terminal 5 does, yeah. but not, yeah. you know what I mean? So yeah. I'm hoping for future tours that... Um, you can have this be part of your rider? Yeah, man. Well, that, that I'd have it in the bus and I'd yeah. be able to pull it out and 
15 minutes set up, whatever. Amazing. And because really, if I, if I can, I mean, it's an amazing way to drop into your body. Yeah. And it's an incredible way to, yeah, be just get into presence again. I mean, the yeah. ice, like the cold will, there is nowhere you can be but present. Do that before Eight. performing would be a good thing. Yeah, and I wouldn't do I wouldn't do 15 minutes before performing. In fact, I I that's really like the hero's dose for me. I wouldn't do that daily. I was doing 10 minutes a day for a while, and then I when I went back to I went to Poland this winter with women. My instructors there were like, "Wow, you're doing 10 a day?" Yeah. Oh. Okay. They're like, "That's that's a lot, bro." Like you know, you might be you might want to dial it back yeah. kind of because. And I, I did notice when I started to do three minutes, two to three minutes is like energizing and 10 is more like exhausting. Yeah. For me, if I really need to get rinsed out, I'll do 10. But it's, if I want for, for pre-show, like two to three minutes is chef's kiss. There's so much. I mean, I, you know, we're going to have to do more. Yeah, we'll do. I love talking to you, man. Me it's too. So, what a joy. I'm yeah. so glad. And I feel so privileged that I feel so at ease with you that we can just roll because, yeah, man. I mean, I also acknowledge that I may be talking to a friend, but also talking to a really extremely important artist. Man, and I thank feel that you, way man. About you. I'm so stoked you feel that way. Part of your journey that includes this mushroom thing and the whim and, and all of this self searching that you do, you end up. Like when you show up kind of in public again, you know, making work with a label, with kind of, a, at least for now, a new philosophy about the way you want to make records. Yeah. Here it now finally comes out in the work that you make. Yeah. So you went on that journey, this yeah. deep, dark journey. You came out the other side of it. Yeah. I'm dealing with this idea that you have about making live records. You want to go back to a place where eliminating too many options is a healthy thing creatively. And so yeah. you're going to eliminate like kind of the main, most of them. <laughs> most of them. Yeah. The way, the way we make records. And you know, it's funny. I was talking to my dad today and I was like, I was telling him about this, about this philosophy. And he was like, you know, John Coltrane used to like cutting tape. You know, he used to splice mm. between takes. You know? Yeah, yeah. Between takes yes. is different. Between takes. So yeah. that so and I was like, I think you draw you have to draw out certain lines. Like, because on the one hand you have that, which is okay, we're capturing performances and we're choosing between performances. I think we can all agree, like, that's yeah. still a very organic way of using technology. Yeah. All the way to here's this new plugin where you sing six takes of something and it will tune and align all of them for you. Yeah, that's like too much. That's too much. There is such a thing in life as too much of a good thing. Right. You know, and everybody's got their own rules that they come up with for themselves answering these questions. Or they don't. And they fall down bad yeah. rabbit holes and they're like, oh, shit, I overtuned that or I over tweaked that or I find that I don't feel the same emotional impact anymore to this music because I, oh, I fixed it too much. I made yeah. it too correct or whatever, you know. Yeah. And you have pulled all the way back, at least for now, to this yeah. like, you know what, I'm not even going to engage with those questions what i want to do yeah. is play this music and sing it and if i can't play it and can't sing it it's not going on the record yeah i wanted to know what that was like i i felt i started to get the sense over the years that the live shows were like just amazingly electric yeah and i don't mean electric guitar i mean like yeah. the electricity was yeah zzz, you know yeah. and really when i had lewis cato come out to do the live tracking with me and Lee Pardini and Dart, Joe Dart. That was the first time I had cut my own music band in a room, but we were all in isolation, you know, iso booth drums. That's why I mentioned that you had said that to me at Madison Square Garden. Cause I remember yeah. you said to me, yeah, dude, dude, Cato came out and it was fucking amazing. And you know, obviously Lewis is amazing to play with, but also yeah. when I saw where you ended up on this record, I was like, I feel like that's the outgrowth of finally putting your hands up and going, I'm not, I can't yeah. do everything. Like I have to allow yeah. this moment to be captured. That's a bigger thing in my life. I, what you just said, I can't do everything. I still don't have a manager, you know, but like I, I want one. Yeah. I, w I could really use one now in my career, in my life. I mean, for my music career. So like- yeah. Calling all managers, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, and I've had managers before and I, I wasn't ready or, yeah. you know, or I was ready for whatever that was, which is yeah. to teach me that I needed to go learn more on my own. Yeah. And now I've learned enough to kind of know what I need help with, but bringing in the band and cutting it live, I used to have this, like, I have to play all the instruments. Yeah. It was important to me that everybody knew I played yep. bass, guitar, drums. And it's like, okay, I meet Joe Dart and I'm like, mm. you know, I'm hanging my bass on the wall, man. Yeah. 
It's not because I don't love the bass. It's just like I love the way Joe plays yeah. bass. Lucky me. That uh, what a what a treat I get to play with Joe. That's totally. uh, that's ridiculous. Like you know, like I'm yep. I'm so grateful for that. And then I had just some stuff to prove. You know, that was a part of my journey I had to go through. And then when I when I brought Lewis and Lee Pardini and, and Dart in on those. Cuts not half together. the record or something, right? Not the whole record. It actually was only, I think it was three. It was, yeah. I don't want to be a billionaire. You could be president. And what did you mean when yeah. you said love? Which those were the three top songs on the record. So close your eyes and cover up your ears. This ain't the message that you came to hear. But I can't help it if I just don't care. I don't want to be a billionaire. Those did, yeah, they did the best on Spotify even, which was hilarious. They were also, because it's like, huh, does the algorithm sense the authenticity? Or maybe it's that people are sensing it, you know, and it's getting picked up that way. I also just enjoyed it the most. I enjoyed the process of making those songs the most. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, it's very clear that that was the most fun I had during that album process. Like, the most joy. (laughs) And does that get captured? You know, That's the question. Are we recording more than just the notes? Are we recording the spaces in between the notes? You know, are we are we recording I, the, I the think air? There, there's not a doubt in my mind to the point where I don't even think it's a question. Yeah. Although I understand that you yeah. asked, I'm glad you yeah. asked. It is like to me, recordings or the art form yeah. of recording is taking a sonic picture mm-hmm. of an, a moment in time. If the question is, can we tell from the photograph that you were in a bad mood? The answer is probably, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, sometimes, hell yeah, obviously. You know, there are those who would argue, well, that's fine. Give me a photo of you in a bad mood, and I'll drop it in Photoshop, and I can make you look like you're in a good mood. Fair enough. Yeah. You know? Different art form to me. Yeah, totally. And I'm not trying to be a hard ass about it. I just think that's a different thing. Yep. That's editing. Yep. And there's an art to editing. Yep. Editing is tremendous. It's gorgeous. beautiful. There's so much you can do there. I just think with recording, I I hope people are not confusing... Coltrane perhaps Mm -hmm. splicing between two takes because up to the bridge was crushing from take one and the band was actually so in the pocket that there was literally no tempo change. change. So we can actually take the bridge out from take three. I've done that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But but imagine Coltrane playing a hundred solos and literally choosing each of the hundred yeah a couple like, bars or or note by note yeah. bro i mean you know people comp vocals note by note yeah that's not a joke yeah i've done it myself it's totally insane that's not well that's the same wait no and i understand from you that part of it is like i don't trust myself like i don't want to be responsible for that's having... what it is i don't enjoy making records that way yeah so then what am i giving you what am i asking you to sell or pay for yeah something that i didn't enjoy yeah and it's not like I don't enjoy the records I've made in the past. I yeah. love everything I've made. I'm proud of all of it, truly. And I, I think Heartbreak Hits is an amazing yeah. album. I mean, if I may say so myself. <laughs> or whatever. But I, no, I do. I think. I, let me say it. It's a great album. Is that your second favorite record that you've made? I think it is. I mean, I love them all, but I, the first one is really close to the source. Yep. Yeah. And it's, I'm a younger songwriter. I don't feel like a very, I'm not a very practiced songwriter. So you can tell that I like have some natural aptitude for it. But to me, it's kind of mostly pretty young Mm -hmm. songwriting, but it's emotionally high quality, but the writing is pretty young kid to me. So I don't play much of that music and it's, I'm sorry to anyone who wants to hear it. Sometimes people complain and they say, you went to Brooklyn, you didn't play Brooklyn, but it's like, I wrote it when I was 19 and You know, I don't, it was never like some international radio hit that makes me need to play it for the rest of my life. So I I figure, you know, come on this journey with me now. But yeah, the newest one is is there again. It's like full source. Yeah. And we've gotten good enough as musicians to try this out. I mean, and really when I saw that let it or the uh yeah, the let it be yes. dot oh, get man. back. I mean, it was just like, well, now we all know. Now we all know for a fact 
how one of the greatest albums ever made was made, and it yeah. was made in a hilarious set of bullshit, <laughs> bullshit <laughs> circumstances with like all these different people there who were screaming, like shouting, throwing their own ego bullshit in these in these twenty seven year old and twenty. Well, how was George twenty so three? Kid, yeah. Like, and there and people are telling him you got to play a concert in the, in a in a pyramid, and he's like, huh? <laughs> and they end up being like, fuck it, man, we're just go on the roof. <laughs> And play, and it's like, it's so amazing how, that they were they wrote that record in a month. Yeah, and then they started writing the next one too. Like half of the next record is written there too. It's incredible. You see, Let It Be getting written. Oh, dude, I had to turn it off. It I, I turned it back. I, I had, I there was a number of times. It took me like a month to get yeah. through that documentary because I kept turning it off. Oh, right. Like, no, I heard you say that. Like, I am I, are we are we gonna watch this? Right? We're yeah, just I gotta, gonna watch this. I happen. can't watch this. I'm gonna watch it. Like it was like, whoa, that was a really affirming. Thing to see it was like yeah. that's how they recorded that stuff yeah and i don't i want to be clear that it's not the only way to make records yeah. but it is the way that our heroes made their records yeah. and i don't mean they didn't yeah you can use headphones you can go in iso booth it's all good you can overdub a backing vocal yeah and, totally what, and i did on did this you? record did yeah you? yeah so everything you hear on the album is a single full performance vocally mm-hmm. bass guitar yeah drums keys i think the vocal aspect of it is probably the most radical of it like i think i mean even like when you know i'll do a lot of records where you'll go in and get rhythm tracks and maybe a scratch vocal if the singer's not playing i know and then go and fix it you know but the idea that you're going to do the piano take and the vocal take and also like this is such a dorky thing but you know that room is small man i don't even know what the phase implications in that it's not i'm not even talking about bleed but phase i know scares the shit out of me when i look at the videos of your studio well i hired phil weinrobe who is a engineer out of brooklyn new york and he bless his heart he understands phase we talked about it and i kept being like are you sure the drum shouldn't be in another room? He's like, yeah. no, 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 I'm not worried about phase. I'm not worried about bleed. I'm like, wow, okay. I mean, it was really a trust fall. Yeah. I basically had to spend all my money trying this experiment. Yeah. <laughs> and really to get the trust fall that yeah. life was asking me to give yeah. myself, which was, you know, it was really scary, man. And I and I came into that session having like almost lost my voice because I had done the Wim Hof retreat the week prior. And I had this like tremendous breathwork session where like I screamed by yeah. accident. I just couldn't control it. Wow. Cause after like an hour and a half of this deep breathing, I just had this like scream rip through me that kind of really mm-hmm. fatigued me. And then I did this big gig with Wolf and then I drove through the night and did my own gig. I was I was exhausted. Little, yeah. And I just like, all right, here we go. It was scary. It was scary, scary, scary. And I had a great group of musicians. Um, James Henry Jr. was producing, Phil was recording, Nick was assisting, the band was crushing. My homie Mike Shea made all the we I hired him to be there to like tech anything that yeah. came up and I felt so held by this crew. Yeah. And we were all aligned in the mission and I love that album, man. I'm just I've never been more proud of anything. So I think there's I'm not telling anybody how to record, but I I feel pretty that I can pretty safely say that there is a relationship between yeah you finding a process that is that is risky yeah a bit for you yeah so that you are on your best game yeah and so there's real consequence if you don't have your best game there's a relationship between that process yes. and how much you are proud of what you make so the possibility of, of failure i think there has to be the risk of failure is like present there you know what's failure. on the other side of risk reward this is not a this is not a vibe thing people yeah. think this is like a financial concept yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. not it's a life concept yeah. you know the the squirrel that's willing to go the extra yeah yeah 40 feet outside his normal turf is might rewarded. find more food or he yeah. might get killed. Yeah. I need those stakes in my process. Yeah. Phil has a term, I think, yeah. sorry, Phil, if I'm butchering this, but I think it's called the Enzo field. Have you heard about this? I think it's Japanese. Mm. Again, sorry to anybody yeah. who knows what this is. But it was this idea that, and I think it was a Japanese concept yeah. where it was like, you can make a couple edits in something, yeah. but once you make mm. beyond a certain amount, you've broken the the field. The field. So everyone's going to have to decide that for themselves. Live capture is a photograph. Yeah. And then overdub is coloring on the photograph. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's still a picture. Yeah. You just need to take a picture of something. Yes. If all you're left with is 
basically, you know, to try to draw an analogy here, if all you're left with is like an AI yeah. drawing of Leo Sidron, yeah. then who gives a shit? Not, yeah. I don't. Certainly not me. Considering the journey that you went through in confronting what your motivations were and outgrowing that need to prove something to your father or whatever, mm -hmm. you closed the record with a song called Nobody Loves You Like Your Mother. Yeah, man. Which actually is a tribute to both my mom and my dad and really deeply to my dad because my dad would say that. That's that's a quote from my dad. Nobody loves you like your mother. Nobody loves you like that girl. Not your father, sister, or brother. Nobody in this whole damn world. Not every question has an answer. But this is one I know for sure. Nobody loves you like your mother. Nobody loves you like that girl. Oh no. My dad told me that often. And he really made sure that I knew that. And it was wild because I'm like, what do you mean? You, but you love me, right? He's like, yeah, I love you, man. I love you so much. But I'm just telling you, nobody loves you like your mother. It's like, don't forget. You know, I think he really want, he wanted to instill that in me. And yeah. he knew that I was particularly looking up to my dad. Mm. And he was like, yo, mom. Yeah. I mean, I was always, my mom's to this day is yeah. my best friend. We're very yeah. close. We've always been close since I was born, yeah. but which I feel, we both feel very grateful for. But I know, just... That that really is a tribute to both my parents, but yeah. I wouldn't have had that concept without my dad. Yeah. So <laughs> so that's, that's kind of kind of funny that that's the case. Yeah, and that's another thing where all the songs on this record they're not all tearjerkers, but they all are deep to me. And even something that's fun like Five Watt Rock. Yeah. That came from having a conversation with a psychologist where he was like, "You're not trying to cast a wide net." the current technological environment yeah. is such that we all have Instagram. We yeah. all think we need to reach a hundred million people. He's yeah. like, no, you're going to take a 50. He's like, you got a yeah. little 50 watt transmitter and you're just blasting this little signal out and you're going to find one person like your partner, you know, who's going to dig your the sound. Gr the like girl's going to think I sing good. Well, that that's, I, yeah. I turned it into, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like in that crowd, there's yeah. a special gal who yeah. thinks I'm all right. Cause I sing so well. Yeah. Oh, da -da. And then I do that. listened to him talking i was like that, that psychologist was like wait a second i should write a song about that and then i was like 50 watts is too loud like that's too loud of an amp <laughs> so five watt but that's deep to me you know and it's like more about doing your thing it's yeah. like don't worry about yeah what the world's throwing at you you yeah. know and don't get distracted like be the wheel you know and it that's also a prayer for humanity because i pray that we can remember that in this transition it is a transition, man, and it is going fast. I will tell you... It's going to get faster. Everybody, I think, in every generation thinks that they are living through magical times. But No doubt. I think what we're about to go through, what we've already started going through... It's going to be like... There is no previous model for what has happened. It's going to be like a thousand X, the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. The internet is a pretty big one. And yeah. in the space of human existence, when you think, okay, the, let's say the internet's 30 years old, yeah. that's pretty fast for oh the idea, God. like, if the internet went down tomorrow, like, what could we even do? I know, and that's, and we don't, we don't often see these transitions because they happen yeah. gradually enough yeah. for us to not, yeah. it doesn't hit us like a lightning bolt, but if you think about, like, people have, I hear sometimes people be like, well, don't you think we're evolving with the smartphone? And I say, absolutely not. Not a chance in hell. The smartphone is 14 years old, y'all. No, what, 16 evolving. years old? That's not an evolutionary time. <laughs> no, but I do think what's interesting is I think social media is not a tool. Everything else is something that we use and doesn't want anything from us, right? Like the, Yeah, it's like agnostic to our yeah. use of it. Right. The wheel does not demand anything of us. No. 
but social media does. Yes, demands the most precious thing we have. What time? <laughs> our our consciousness. Our consciousness. It's a, consciousness suck, it, and our time. Yes, we are evolving in that we become tools. Sure. For social media, we okay. are the tool. We're the product. We're the product. Yeah. We're the asset for them. We are being yes. delivered to them, to advertisers or whatever, but it's demanding of us. And so it's not an evolution. It's an inversion. Correct. Of the relationship to technology. Yes. And even when you think about what you're talking about with a gun, the gun at a certain point already is controlling us, even though it's not social media. It's like mm-hmm. the gun, you pick up a gun and you know there's only one thing to do with it. This trigger wants to be pulled. And so you're going to pull yeah. the thing because it's what uh-huh. it's asking you to do. Yeah. But with social media, it's, it's even much further along because it's it's going to ping you it's going to bug you it's going to bother you it's going to demand of you and as long as we have a financial incentive based on mining and selling your data to advertisers third-party advertisers then our attention will be ripped from our brains so let me ask you this though then but there is possible for a different financial model to exist and it's started i think there will need to be a better incentive yeah like there will need to yeah that's that's a topic for another podcast, but I have a lot to say about. But it. I, I can, I'm sure you do. But one thing I will ask about this with you is, how do you find space in your life to create, yes. to center yourself, to be a person who knows who you are and what you care about, and has anything that you can deliver to an audience? I right? know, man. And at the same time, the only way for you to fully reach your audience is to engage with these tools on some level. I think you're right. I can't think of a single artist reaching thousand cap rooms. Like mm. it's, I can't think of a single artist who wants to tour and who isn't either doing social media or isn't doing social media, but is from the nineties essentially, oh. like is essentially from the legacy model. Yeah. Just point being, you know, yeah. sometimes like really, if you really think through yeah. it, it's like, I don't think there's a single one who hasn't used social media. Right. My take on that is like, yeah, it's a trade off and I'm going to choose the thing that brings me joy every time over the other thing, I have to take my songwriter hat off and be promo guy till this tour is over. And I'm not ever going to be able to be as effective as any more than I am. I would love to have help. If radio still worked, I'd love to be on that. Maybe it does. I don't know. People tell me it does, but then they tell me it costs 10 grand a week to service it. It's like... (laughs) Okay. It's like a weird thing, man. But you're headlining rooms that people that are spending 10 grand a week at radio yeah. can't headline it. It's like you're overdeveloped in some aspects of your True. career and then ca- trying to catch up in other aspects. No doubt. I'm grateful. This is where I think the spotlight that Wolfpack cast on me as a person, like just as wh- yeah. who's what's a Theo Katzman, then people find my work and they're like, maybe they think, oh, wow, this guy's good. Yeah. And also, I have been doing this for a long while, and I think I'm lucky. I don't, I don't know what has created the overall impact, but I just want to share the idea that like it's never harmful to make your best work and be great at what you do. Like you might as you got to start there, you know. I think that's that's incumbent on all artists. So when people talk about like, well, should we do more social media or make more songs? It's like <laughs> the the impact of if anyone's listening, like if one person's listening and you blow their mind, they are going to make sure that 25 people know. That's right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if that blows 10% of those yeah. people's minds, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> That's organic growth. The attention on this tour is like yeah. the rooms aren't sold out, but yeah. they're full and you can hear a pin drop. Yeah. It's kind of freaking us all out. I thought it was like, oh, wow, it's just Salt yeah. Lake City. Yeah. They don't drink here, you know? No. Nope. And they're like, whoa, New York the other night, Terminal 5. It's like, dang, cool, man. Yeah. That's important to me. That's more important than anything else. The thing is, if you think about promo or you think about marketing, it sounds kind of like a bummer, dirty word, like marketing or something. A lot of artists don't like that. But imagine being a restaurant in Brooklyn that nobody knows exists. <laughs> How are you going to tell people? No, of course. There were people in the business who were artists at promoting. Yeah. Or that were celebrated in the business for being creative, for understanding how to do this and that. And of course, they were all crooks and the business was skewed against right, artists. Right, right. But there were people who lived and breathed and went to bed and woke up thinking about how to market a record. Totally. And now that's also supposed to be you. Yeah, I know. It's tough, man. It's also the same reason that we can make a record for free with a laptop, you know? Or essentially. Yes, exactly. Not, not 
not a million dollars. So it's like, yep. it's both and, you know, and, yep. and I think we all need to kind of navigate that, ride that line. We're all going to do it differently there, but I, I'm at least aware that if I make my best work and I feel my internal audience give me a thumbs up because yeah. it saw me do my best, yeah, then I will be a happier person than if I don't. Yeah. So that's a non-negotiable for me now. And we'll see, we'll see if we can get it heard but i'm not going to i'm not going to die over that i'm yeah. not going to cry over the that spilled milk yeah. in a way of being like you know what i mean i mean it it bums me out sometimes if i think i'm not reach i mean i'm yeah i'm i'm only as effective as i can be in that in that realm and i i would love to know how to do better and and if anybody is hmm. able to help me i'm i'm i trust that life will will connect me with the right people to help me with that, who who see the growth potential, yeah. you know, or the or at least are like, wow, are you? I think you might. I think I'm one of the. I got to be one of the. I mean, I talked to my agent today. It was like, there can't be that many other artists with no manager at, at this, this tier level. of venue, and it's like, yeah, you're the only one. In some ways, that may be the sort of like the legacy of Jack, right? Is that you saw it work. Yes, I know. You know what I mean? I know. So you're like, no, no, we can do this. I can do this. This is a thing that can be done. Totally. I you're right. And I've talked I talked to Jack yesterday about this. It was like I I've done my best. Yeah. And I think for what I'm doing, you know, everybody that I know who's in the singer songwriter lane that's actually reaching people in the sort of public yeah. lexicon yeah. is, you know, has some some help. Yeah. And of he course. was like, Oh, dude, do it. And I'm like, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, he's like I mean, my Jack, dude. Jack is out there auctioning you off to to marry somebody at Bond. You know what I mean? He's a, he's shameless. He's like, he's, that's but a... it's but that's part of the art too. Yeah. Is it's like Jack's art is also human communication through yes. the internet, and yeah. also like create. It's so creative. It's so it's so risky. It's yeah. like to me is like you know Jack. He's the Rebbe, man. I call. Yeah. I, I'm like, yo, I got a question for the Rebbe. He does it to me too. He's yeah. like, I got a rabbinical yeah. question. You know, he's yeah. <laughs> You got a Talmud question. For yeah, you. so we we really you know we support each other and and I feel so happy to be doing what I'm doing and I love my friends I love Wolfpack I love that community I love my brothers in that and you know I love my band I'm just stoked man I'm stoked for it it all happening it feels like it's connecting and I really know now that like I don't have those fears we started with the the podcast with yeah. I'm not like yeah. are people coming to see me it's yeah. like yeah, yeah they are they are and and. I'm stoked, but it is, and yeah, there's ego there, but it's also that I wanted, I just wanted to know I was doing something that people gave a shit about, you know? Yeah. I think people do give a shit about Amen. it. Amen. And if they don't, I'm still going to do it. Yeah. That's well, the deeper exactly. thing, that, you know? That's right. Theo Katzman, I love you. I love you too, Thank Leo. you for coming back out. Man, thanks for having me. And thank you for making such beautiful work. Thank you, man. It means so much to me that you feel that way. There he was, my friends, Theo Katzman. I know Theo loves his latest record, but I love some of his old records too, and I want to take us home with one of my favorite tracks off of his 2017 album, Heartbreak Hits. This is My One Bedroom. You bring your boots and your yoga pants I'll bring my copy of the royal scam We can get down to the steely dam In my one I'll be back again in your headspace before you know it with another deep dive. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. This has been a WBGO Studios production. To learn more about WBGO Studios award-winning podcasts, special concerts, live streams, and more, visit wbgo.org studios.